Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll ask, does uh, anybody uh, who uh, need an interpretation services? Alguien que no habla inglés? Todo el mundo está bien? Perfecto. I think we're good. Todo bien. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rich Reyes Gavel. I'm the executive director of the DC Public Library, and it is a uh, a thrill to be here tonight at the Mount Pleasant Library. Um, thank you, La Clinica del Pueblo, for having this fantastic uh, program here at our Mount Pleasant Library. How many Mount Pleasant residents here? Great, uh, me too. So I'm a, I'm a Mount Pleasant resident. Um, I'm also uh, the son and brother of immigrants. Uh, I moved to DC 10 years ago now and uh, from New York City and my wife and I uh, we're looking for a neighborhood that reminded me of my own immigrant upbringing in New York, and uh, and we could not be happier uh, than than we are living in Mount Pleasant. So, um, welcome all. Um, apologies for uh, first of all those of you who are standing. We knew this uh, this program was going to be very crowded. There are 55 holds on copies of uh, Jonathan's book. So, if you're one of those people, just be patient. Uh, you know that the budget in DC is not great and our collections budget has been has been suffering. Um, so, you know, it's it's great. Um, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm wonderful friends with Suyana uh, Barker, who is the operations manager at La Clinica. And she was the one that reached out to, yes. Uh, she reached out to me to uh, to participate and I'm I'm so honored that she did. Um, I've got to say, just as a as a neighbor, uh, the work that La Clinica del Pueblo does is so inspiring. Um, um, as a lifelong librarian whose mission is to um, help uh, people who need uh, an additional support in one way or another, whether it's with literacy or health or uh, finding a job or finding a, a, a you know a placement for their child in school, I think there's a lot of synergy between the work of La, La Clinica and the library. And I love that they rely on us because uh, they just couldn't be a better neighbor and the work that they do deserves all the funding and deserves all the help. So um, uh, tonight uh, we couldn't be in a, in a better place. Uh, Jonathan Blitzer, is this is his second trip to DC, I think, because you were at um, Politics and Prose a little while back. Of course, Mount Pleasant is, is much better um, than up there, yes. Um, except the library up there, which is all um, the libraries are great. So you should uh, go to all of them. Um, he's here. He's in support of his new book. Everyone who is gone is here. And uh, I'm sure they'll get into it. But there is a deep connection between his research on Central America and La Clinica del Pueblo. And I can't wait to hear about it in all uh, transparency. I've not read the book yet, but the reviews have been glowing. Uh, both the Times and the Post have fantastic reviews of this book. Um, he is a, a staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, my favorite journal in the whole world, despite the fact that there's a stack of them um, that have yet to be read on my nightstand. They will be read, damn it, I'm going to get to them. Um, and he's also just off-decorated. He's been, won many awards and nominated for many, and, and I hope that this book is going to be nominated for many awards as well. Um, so with that, thanks again for coming. Uh, do make yourself comfortable. We can't control much of the heat in here, and there's a lot of folks. So um, it's my uh, absolute honor to introduce Edgar Jimenez, who is the uh, chair of the board of La Clinica del Pueblo. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rich. Thank you to the Mount Pleasant Library uh, for hosting us tonight. It, we really appreciate it. It's it's really wonderful to come back here, um, to come back here and check out the books and check out the library. The library looks totally different than when I used to come here as a kid. It looks fantastic. So I'm very happy that it's gotten the upgrade that it needed because it's it's a beautiful facility. Uh, as Rich said, my name is Edgar Jimenez. I am the chair, the current chair of La Clinica del Pueblo. Uh, I am a native Washingtonian. I grew up down the street from La Clinica and down and, and this area. So I love it. Uh, I've always loved coming over here, uh, have a great time. Um, I am honored tonight to host on behalf of La Clinica del Pueblo's board, uh, board uh, to host you all here tonight. Uh, I am joined by a couple of my colleagues in the audience, but on the stage here, on the front here, we have Carolyn Zulgaldia. 
the tongue twister, I'm sorry. Uh, she is a she's a board member with us and she's also a an, a very active member and resident of this area of, uh, of Mount Pleasant. Uh, we're also joined by Suyana Barker. Suyana, as mentioned before, is the chief programs officer uh, for La Clinica del Pueblo. She's been part of lead, part and leading of many of La Clinica's initiatives over the past 15 years to ensure continued uh, we continue to meet the evolving needs of Latin American immigrants in this area. As a member of this, uh, as having grown up in this community and having uh, been a uh, part of La Clinica for, I was trying to figure out, I think it's a little over 20 years now volunteering. I started volunteering about 20 years ago and having been, and being part of the board now, uh, Jonathan, I was in awe of what you were able to portray through the, through, through the true stories, complex policy and events and their impact on immigration uh, over the past 50 years. Uh, honestly, for those of us at La Clinica, it was like sharing our origin story. Uh, Jonathan, you included a poem uh, in the beginning of this book by a Quiche Mayan poet from Guatemala uh, by the name of Humberto Acabal. I'm hoping, uh, the, the apostrophe always gets me in Spanish, so, but it's, I think it's Acabal. And it goes like this. Now and then I walk backwards. It is my way of remembering. If I only walked forward, I could tell you about forgetting. So that is a great segue into what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, tonight, we are gonna be walking backwards and talking about where La Clinica came from. La Clinica's main character, one, or one of the main characters, is a founding director and key leader in the development of La Clinica del Pueblo. And his name is Dr. Juan Romaglosa. So I had, uh, yeah. Exactly. So you you know him. You've heard him. You've seen him. Yes, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Romagosa uh, several times, and he is the reason why I'm here. He's one of the first people I met at La Clinica and was one of the most welcoming and wonderful people. Uh, I was captivated by him, and I think and many of you had the opportunity of working with him at La Clinica. Many of you, some of you were served by him. Uh, he laid foundation with volunteers for, from Caresen, partner organizations, the D.C. Health Department for La Clinica. The DC Health Department gave us our first grant in the 1980s to help with HIV treatment. Now, as I look at it, at all of you here in the audience, I'm moved and I see to see the people who have been part of our story all along, whether you started in El Salvador, Guatemala, Venezuela, uh, uh, Mexico, or here. You know, we're all here because we care about the communities that we are and we're here to ensure inclusion and belonging. Dr. Romagosa was one of, this was one of his key values uh, and he exuded, that he exuded every day's interactions. But he was also very intentionally in this, in the way he built La Clinica with the community, community at heart. With that, I'd like to introduce you to some of our community. Would all the members of the staff of La Clinica either stand or raise your hand, please. With, uh, I think we have one other board member, Gerardo Portillo, our treasurer, I think is around here somewhere. Uh, if you are a past board member of La Clinica, would you raise your hand? If you're a past volunteer of La Clinica, would you raise your hand, past or current? I'd like to acknowledge the current director of Caresen, the organization that started La Clinica. Uh, his, he is a current director of Caresen. He is a past board member and current uh, member of our search committee for, to find our executive director. And that's Abel Nunez in the back. Despite everything, he's still very shy. He's also very tall, as we discovered today after seeing him off of Zoom. 
So again, we'd like to thank everyone for coming. We'd like to thank you all and everybody, especially our, our staff members. I didn't get to say that our staff is our frontline personnel to the community and we appreciate them so much. And we just can't say enough about the quality of work that they do every single day. So I wanna thank them personally for the work that they do. Every single one of you has a job to do and you do it so well and you make us so proud. And I know as a former community member here, it, it's great work and we appreciate it. So thank you very much to our staff. All right, so to move us along, to move our pro program along before I get the hook from somebody, I know I'm being eyed for that. Uh, I'm gonna start off with my first question to, to Jonathan. Jonathan, you plan to share a reading about Juan's early days uh, with La Clinica. But before we jump into that, can you share how you came to write this tremendous book, Connect with Juan, and what uh, Juan meant to this project? Thank you, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and th thank you all for being here. Maybe I'll... This feels like a diva move to pull the mic out, but, but we, yeah, yeah, when we're done. Um, th th thank you all so much for being here. And I, um, I, I've said this to everyone involved, but this has been, you know, you, you write a book and you do all these events and it's thrilling and a kind of blur, but this, this one is the most meaningful by far uh, and the most special for me uh, because of its connection to Juan, uh, who in, in many ways, to, to my mind, um, is the beating heart of this book. Um, I, I strangely got to know him sort of later on, after, after I had the idea to try to get into the aspects of this story, the story being the kind of history of the United States and the three countries in Central America and kind of understanding how closely entwined these countries have become and how you can't understand the present moment without regard to the past. That was the kind of initial premise. Um, and there were a few people I had known uh, who really animated my sense of how to set out to tell the story. Um, there was another main figure in the book, also Salvadoran, younger than, than Juan, uh, a, a Guatemalan woman, a Honduran woman, uh, people whose stories really, I think, illuminated some of these essential connections that I was trying to portray. Juan kind of always haunted the idea even before I met him personally, um, I had known about Juan as, as I mean, many of you in attendance know Juan, the full arc of Juan's story. Um, but I first heard about Juan Ramagosa um, as a result of the trial he was involved in. Uh, there were two iterations of it uh, in the early 2000s, beginning 2002, uh, involving basically a civil litigation brought against two Salvadoran generals who kind of amazingly, and I think very revealingly of U.S., foreign and immigration policy after their involvement in war crimes in El Salvador very calmly and uneventfully moved to Florida um, at a time, mind you, and you, you all know this, at a time when, you know, 98 percent of asylum seekers from El Salvador were being rejected um, for, for reasons entirely related to American foreign policy. Um, and so the, the, these two trials, the first was this civil trial, and then there was a subsequent immigration trial because these two generals were eventually deported in 2015. Juan was the lead plaintiff in those cases. Um, and the testimony he gave as a witness was incredibly moving and almost had this sort of mythic status. I mean, if you followed the press accounts, um, as I did, uh, or if you spent any time reading some of these court documents, which were publicly available, there was just this sense of someone who was almost hard to believe in his kind of saintliness, in his commitment to to the values of La Clinica, to the values of, of you know, access to medical care as a human right. Um, that more than any anything else I've ever uh, encountered in my conversations with Juan was actually his kind of animating vision. Um, and so I, I had known about Juan indirectly through all of these through all of these historical accounts, but I didn't know the full story of his life or even how he came to arrive in the United States. Um, and honestly, it seems strange to say now, the pandemic is partly uh, the reason why we were able to connect as we did. Um, we were both stuck inside. We had nothing to do. And, and those who know Juan know he's a hard man to pin down. He's very busy. Um, but because of the pandemic, he was at home. Um, and we started talking on the phone um, and those conversations picked up. So we basically the first year of our conversations 
Um, we spoke every single day at four o'clock for one, for one year. Um, and then in the second year, we scaled it down a, a little bit more. Uh, we did it about maybe four days a week. Um, and the conversations continue. And in fact, I spoke to Juan as I literally walked into this building tonight to let him know that we were all here. And obviously he sends his love and is very excited. Um, but this is how Juan sort of unspooled his full story. And, and for me, journalistically, I've never had that level of, I mean, to, to speak kind of as a journalist first, uh, I've never had that level of access to anyone before. I mean, I'm typically, I go pretty deep with subjects of, of, of things that I write, but this was someone I was able to spend years getting to know on a, almost a daily conversational level. Um, and I basically set out to almost repopulate certain moments of his life and started to kind of almost draw concentric circles around him and around individual experiences of his and slowly start to fill out a broader picture of what his world meant. Um, and needless to say, all roads, this is mixing the metaphor slightly, but all roads lead back to Mount Pleasant, to La Clinica. Um, so it's extraordinarily meaningful to me that we're, that we're here. Exactly. Juan joked that it was, yeah, yeah, Juan, well, you know, one of the strange things, you know, you know, journalistically, this stuff, it makes sense that, you know, if you have the ability to talk to someone at great length, you would, but in the normal world, outside of journalistic circles, it's a very strange idea, and Juan, Juan's family members would ask him, like, so what are you doing on the phone today? What is it at four o'clock? You have to go because you have your... Are you speaking to a therapist? Who is this? Who you're you're speaking to every day for? And Juan, the only way Juan could ex could explain it was that it was basically like a kind of a pregnancy that you had to just wait it out, and the, the sort of the conversations would grow. Only in this case, is a pregnancy that lasted eh, maybe three years. Um, thank you so much, and I'm we're so thrilled to have you here, and I just love seeing the references to this place that I call home now. That I feel very honored to live here, and. For instance, the reference to Don Juan in the story, it's still there and it's bright purple. Um, we love it. So um, you, as you were growing this relationship and the pregnancy with, um, with Juan, um, you've mentioned that he had an influence on naming the book. And it's not, the book is also about many other policy topics like war and the policies that led to so much that we see reflected um, to what's happening in the US with these populations. Um, so what themes can you draw from how Juan helped name the book? And then also like, how does that also ripple through all of those other themes and then what we see kind of arrive here in Mount Pleasant because of those yeah. themes and policies? Yeah. Well, the title of the book um, actually came really at the very, very end of the reporting process after many years of reporting. And uh, I've made reference to these court cases and Juan testified in these court cases. And in particular, the first case he testified in, I mean, that was the first time he was ever, you know, speaking in a courtroom and describing with a level of graphic detail necessarily, given the, the stakes and the circumstances, what had happened to him, the torture he had suffered uh, at the hands of the National Guard in El Salvador in 1980. And it should be said too, and, and this is a meaningful part also of, of La Clinica and the kind of ethos of La Clinica as I've come to understand it through Juan and others. Um, you know, Juan was also very involved in the sanctuary movement, which I know a lot of you know quite well, a uh, church-based movement in the early 1980s uh, that basically tried to deliver on the premise of the 1980 Refugee Act at a time when the Reagan administration was sort of sabotaging the actual practice of asylum. Um, and a, a core component of the activism in the sanctuary movement was having people tell their stories um, and, and, and not doing it just as an opportunity to share trauma, which obviously in some cases was a, a helpful form of relief for people to be able to talk about this, but also to inform people. Um, and it became a real through line in, in Juan's life, telling his story and, and encouraging others to tell their stories. And, and for Juan, there was a, a, a medical component to it. You know, his training was as a heart surgeon, um, but because of the torture he had suffered, he, he wasn't able to perform operations ever again. Uh, and then obviously when he came to the United States, both because of the physical incapacitation and because of the kind of legal bureaucratic holdup of the, you know, he didn't have a medical license here, even though he had been trained as a doctor in El Salvador, um, he had to kind of reorient himself. 
I know this is seeming elliptical in response, but I'm coming back to it. I swear. Um, it's a big book. Yeah, you're seeing part of the problem, right? Uh, and um, so Juan started to kind of rethink a little bit how he related to people in a public health context and realized actually that that mental health, that someone's psychological health is actually a core component of someone's medical treatment. Um, and it sort of seems very obvious and intuitive to us now, but imagine someone who wasn't trained in this and this you know, being in the early 1980s in a community that was not, on a, to make a slight generalization, was not sort of fluent or conversant in the idea of psychological treatment or, or talking through trauma. Um, it was hard to get people to talk. And so one of the things that was most poignant to me in, in getting to know Juan over the years was seeing all of the different ways in which his storytelling um, actually kind of breathed a certain life into the activism, into the history, into the politics, into his relationships with other people, and in his own healing process. And so that I came to understand, when, when I first heard about Juan, I knew him for this testimony he had given in court. But the deeper I got into this relationship with him, the, the better I was able to understand that moment in court as a kind of culmination of many years of his being able to talk in front of other people. I mean, it started in MacArthur Park in Los Angeles with a bunch of homeless, traumatized refugees from Central America who he got in a circle and started to talk. And then that moved with him to Dolores Park in San Francisco and eventually here to La Clinica. And then you find him in this courtroom, and this is brings us to the title, uh, elliptically back to the title, which was there, there was a moment when he at the, the, the trial is over, all of the testimony has been given, um, the, the, the prosecution rests, and the judge is handed a note from a juror. And the juror, the judge reads the note aloud to the courtroom. And this is reflected in the, in the court transcript. And this juror basically has asked if it's possible to see the scars, the physical scars and wounds uh, that Juan had suffered and that one of the other witnesses and plaintiffs in the case had suffered. And everyone was kind of bewildered because a great deal of evidence had already been presented and it didn't seem in a legal sense, you know, necessary for the case to continue. So they asked Juan if he felt comfortable doing this and he, sa he said he did. And there was this moment, which I, I obviously wasn't there for, but I, you know, I have the transcript and I spoke to a number of people in attendance and I obviously spoke to, to Juan as well when he and this other plaintiff are standing before the jury, essentially bearing themselves physically in front of the jury. Um, and in his case, he rolls up he rolls up the sleeve on his shirt um, to show where some of the scarring is. He was shot through the, the wrist. And, you know, he and I, in all of our conversations, um, we never, I, I was always, for, for a lot of the reasons that Juan had educated me on, I was always sort of studiously avoidant of the specifics of the torture he had suffered. I mean, I felt like that was already reflected in these court records in great detail. I didn't want to re-traumatize him. There was no need to go back over those details specifically. But kind of related details were of great interest to me, specifically this moment in the trial. You know, what do you think, what, what is going through your mind and, and your body even when you're standing in front of this jury, having recounted these horrible things that happened to you and, and showing your scars. And as you all know, you, those who know Juan personally, it's actually, and this is a narrative problem to write about him, he is almost, there's a saintliness about him that almost makes him unbelievable as a character. So it's actually a challenge writing about someone like this because a, a reader who's uninitiated in Juan or in his world is gonna be skeptical almost that someone has this level of strength and, and compromiso and you know, that it's something very deep. Um, and Juan tells me that at this moment, he was thinking of all of the people who didn't even have scars, who simply weren't around, people who hadn't survived the torture, hadn't survived the assassinations. And he describes basically a, an almost out-of-body experience in which he kind of imagines himself sort of mingling with them in their spirit. Uh, and those who know Juan know that he's a very religious man, and so this is suffused with a kind of religiosity. And he's standing in front of this jury, and what he says to me that he was thinking was the phrase, everyone who is gone is here. And the second I heard it, I mean, it's, it stopped me in my tracks. Um, and in a kind of incredible way, it's, it, it encapsulates his whole story, but it also encapsulates the premise of the book, which is to try to 
pay a kind of meaningful homage to people whose lives have been trapped in the geopolitics and the immigration politics and these sort of policy debates and all of, all of this, and and whose lives have gotten us to this point in some form or another. So anyway, that's that's the at, at long winded last. That's the story of the of the title. Well, how to keep this conversation without crying now, right? Uh, we totally believe on those energies. I mean, this uh, for us, at least for like clinic, you don't need to explain a lot what means when you have that kind of experience that you're caring of you, so many people. So La Clinica is, um, last year, we celebrate our 40 years. So I never, my, my... <laughs> uh, I am originally from Brazil, and La Clinica taught me about Central America. And my I, my first encounter with La Clinica was this encounter with the immigrant community, right? How to feel at home when you're uh, displaced. So La Clinica was my home, and then I learned to um, respect, understand, and work with and for the Central American community, and I feel very fortunate for that. La Clinica is a, and also uh, end up with me, uh, one of the passions of Dr. Ramagosa, there was the Programa de Ferias. So it's the, the health fairs programs. I know, right? Like, uh, I have, I have a, a Armando Lillian here that was like with Dr. Ramagosa on um, um, Programa de Ferias, was the way that Dr. Ramagosa did what now we call La Clinica Street Medicine. Uh, that was the way that he practiced medicine then. Of course, he didn't have the license to do that, so he did that with the wisdom of the people that was displaced with him, doctors and nurses that were persecuted in Central America, especially El Salvador, and need to uh, help their community. They could not practice medicine, but they could give people uh, guidance. This become the community health action department that then I started leading when I arrived uh, 15 years ago. And I feel that... Uh, Dr. Juan was with us, right, on the on the same kind of energy. So you have something that's a legacy. This was a clinic that before was 300 people, now it's 5,000 people. Then was um, uh, 10 donors and grants, today's more than 100, right, people? Grants and, and funding possibilities. This was um, 13 people working as a volunteers, now we have 150 employed people, 90% immigrants. So it's still the legacy of immigrants working to provide healthcare to immigrants. We're very proud of it. Um, we are very proud. I mean, all my colleagues here, we are in a moment of transition. Edgar said we're like um, searching for a new um, leader, but we feel so proud. We feel that a good organization is the organization who knows the mission and the vision that keep moving because the board is with us, because the team that arrived uh, goes with us. I had one of my colleagues today discussing language at La Clinica, and uh, she uh, has been with us only for two years, right, Michaela? And she said, so, Yana, don't you think we should produce everything first in Spanish and then do the other verse? So, yes, we should produce everything first in Spanish. I mean, besides for people who doesn't want to read in Spanish. But anyhow, um, those are the kind of things that we are so fortunate to have people to come to us, and I think fortunate to have all of you here, too. Uh, and Jonathan, I don't know if you could give us some perspective for this year, right? What we all here should be advocating for. We are very concerned with what the politics is bringing to us. Uh, La Clinica is not only a, a safe space for uh, the community we serve, a safe space also for us to talk about healthcare as a human right. We have a lot of partners here and donors and community members who believe that. That's what's called me for La Clinica. I first read uh, helping us to make healthcare a human right was like, I want to know this organization. So can you tell us a little bit in your perspective what we should be advocating for moving forward, especially this year? I mean, it's I, I'm very intimidated and humbled by the question in this crowd in particular, because I feel like I'm taking my cues from you guys. Um, you know, I just, I just one observation before um, hazarding a response to the question. Um, you know, Juan, one of the things that's so incredible to me in hearing you describe the growth of La Clinica is, you know, Juan's dream had always been to be able to provide free medical care to people who otherwise couldn't afford it. That was his dream for his life in El Salvador. Um, and obviously it was interrupted by the Civil War. And in fact, his commitment to that vision is precisely what 
put him on this crosswise path with the National Guard um, in, in 1980. Um, but the idea that he found that community and that opportunity uh, to realize that vision here was something that I think, um, I mean, it almost goes without saying to say that that changed him forever. But, you know, he, he came to the U.S., he, he, he had said to me, in, in large part because he felt like his activism for the activism to kind of mature and for it to have the kind of traction he wanted it to have, you know, he, he was looking out on El Salvador at the time, and for that matter, on Guatemala as well, and seeing the kind of broad systemic impact of American aid to these repressive military governments. And he was feeling like, okay, I'm sort of fighting every day on, on the street to try to kind of push back against that force, that inexorable force. But at a certain point, I'm going to have to go to the source of that. And I'm going to have to go to the United States and bring my activism and my voice there. Uh, I mean, he he said it to me in, in no uncertain terms in that way. And so for him to come here and and to bring that message and that commitment and then to find in La Clinica an opportunity to um, actually kind of execute this vision that he had had, I mean, it was a dream to him that he found it here. And in fact, one of the things, and, and some of you I know will know this personally, that was so meaningful to him in particular was, you know, he had been on the West Coast for many years before he came to La Clinica, and obviously there are a huge number of Salvadorans on the West Coast, um, but particularly from, from Usulutan and from you know Eastern El Salvador, um, the DC area was a kind of homecoming in the United States for him. So the first night that he ever visited La Clinica, uh, which happened essentially by accident, he described feeling like a wash in these familiar accents. Familiar not like Salvadoran, but familiar like you know, Usluteco accents, you know? Um, so anyway, it's just very special to, to be able to, to kind of connect these dots historically. I, you know, I don't, I get, because I cover immigration and politics, I, I often get these questions, which are very reasonable questions because we seem to be in a very dire moment politically about sort of where the political conversation is going, how we should be thinking about it, what activism ought to look like, and, and I, I hope it doesn't seem like too much of a cop-out to say I, I frankly have no, I mean, I, I'm overwhelmed myself. But I, I do think one thing that, this will sound sort of pie in the sky-ish, but I really mean it. And I actually think it's one of the lessons I've, I've drawn just personally from working on this book. Um, politics is a space that, especially now, is so constraining. Um, you know, the the political maneuvering room just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And we're, we're sort of watching that in real time. And you sort of expect it when there are, um, you know, when there are Republican administrations in the White House, you sort of, you know, expect to have to weather the storm of however long that lasts. But increasingly what we're seeing, and this is no news to anyone here, the kind of knockdown effects, even in the kind of in democratic circles, is that now People are willing to contemplate restrictions on immigration and harsh, harsher enforcement measures that, pro that were really, frankly, inconceivable in many ways, even several years ago. Um, and so I, I think in a way, I, I don't want to be, as a journalist, I don't want to misdiagnose this shrinking political reality because it is a fact. And, and from a purely journalistic standpoint, I feel that I, this is not to sound too grandiose, but... I, I owe a kind of transparent dealing with that reality to readers, as frankly as depressing as it is. Um, but simultaneously, what I think is so important and what I struggle with is to somehow not let my thinking or my feeling or my being also be constricted alongside just the, the, the political sort of restrictionism in various senses that we're seeing. Um, and so that, in, in many ways, um, and again, I, re I realize how this sounds. I realize this sort of sounds corny and like a soft answer to a specific question. But um, to, to me, part of the idea, even of that Akabal quote at the, at the beginning of the book, is, you know, we, we owe it to ourselves. There is a moral responsibility to keep our brains and souls kind of clear and, and open and open to the, to the nuance and to the importance of activism and the importance of community even if it does feel like the world is kind of caving in uh, around us. And so I, so that's, a, 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 you know, maybe a dramatic way of saying, 
from my standpoint, as an as an outsider, not not being a part of of the Mount Pleasant community or di directly a member of La Clinica's community, uh, I I look at the work that La Clinica does, and I I derive real strength and hope from just the continuity of the work, the fact that you know whatever the political winds may be, you guys have you guys have a mission every day, um, and and so that's that's my that's my feeling. Thank you. And I think uh, mixing art with healthcare, where is Rachel? <laughs> Rachel, uh, she is always trying to do with us uh, when you think about development or bringing community with us and support with art. She always tried to bring art. And I think being an author like you today was a, a, a gift for us. Thank you so much. I think the dialogue is so important. I think you said, who once said to talk, right? Who once said to not be silent about what you're living. I think what you just said, right? Let's create space for dialogue because this can heal all of us and also create the strength that we need to keep pushing, right? This situation. Thank you so much for the uh, inspiration. Okay, good. All right, so now we'd like to hear from you. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? We'd like to, you to raise your hand, but I just want to remind you, if you could keep your questions concise, that way we can get as many questions as we can before our time is up. So. Mine, mine is not so much a, a, a question, but a, um, I did a case study on La Clinica del Pueblo looking at the first 25 years, and I was doing a case study of the Latin American Youth Center, and I interviewed Juan as part of it, and at the end of the case study, I said, I got to learn more about this guy, yeah. um, and he wanted me to do a case study focusing on what was the essence of La Clinica and over the years, but I just wanted to add a couple things on human rights. He was such a believer in human rights, and many of the patients who came in uh, treated a doctor like God. You never questioned him. So from the very start, the doctors did not wear coats. They were re uh, referred to by their first names. The emphasis was that these people had the right for to receive care and the responsibility. And one of my favorite memories is they would often stop what they were doing and everybody would go down to protest in front of the White House. <laughs> Yeah. That, that case study is, I was saying before, but it, that case study was foundational for anyone who, who, who wants to or has wanted to understand La Clinica's the history and its mission. That's such, such an invaluable document. Hello. Um, I wanted to start it off by saying my father works for La Clinica del Pueblo, Armando Garcia. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to say that um, I never really knew anything about the mission of La Clinica del Pueblo because, you know, I, I've grown up around this area and he's worked in this facility for a long time. Um, the picture of him is right there in the corner. He's right there um and uh you know as a 17 year old um who grew up in the united states of america but is proud of their heritage of being salvi and from usulutan uh i wanted to ask um what would you say to younger um uh, latin americans or immigrants who or children who are um children of immigrant parents. How, what would you say to them on how to expand their knowledge about where they come from? Because I feel like that is such an important thing. Um, we work so hard to be where we are today. And I feel that a lot of the youth is losing uh, where they come from. And I don't want that to happen. So how would you say to expand on that? How did you, with your father, how did you speak about La Clinica? How did that come up? I mean, I'd love to know how you, how you learned about that. Um, well, I volunteered before for school. Yeah. And <laughs> um, every now and then I've heard the name Juan Romagosa and because my father has met him before. And um, I guess in the moment, I never thought to ask more questions about it because 
my frontal lobe isn't fully developed. So it's like, I don't really think of these things. <laughs> but now that I'm put in the spot where I'm sitting here and I'm listening to someone who has done the research and who has put their time and effort into actually learning about it, I think that this is a great opportunity to actually ask the que these questions because, you know, I don't think about that when I'm talking to him. It's just like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> no, I love I, I love that, and um, honestly, I'm I'm overwhelmed by the question because I um I'm I'm honored that you think I I could have something as meaningful to offer in response as as what you said, you know. One of the things I like about journalism, honestly, is that it's sort of an excuse to just ask questions. Um, and I feel like, you know, as like a normal person in the world, there are like certain social boundaries that you have to observe with, you know, so you don't seem weird or, you know, your behavior doesn't, you know, put people off. And like with journalism, there's always like there's that boundary that you see and you're always you just go a tiny bit over it. You know, it's just one more question. You know, even when you see the, the person you're asking, you're asking the questions to is like, all right, more questions. Yeah, just one more. Um, and so for me, I, I actually think that um, I, I would never, it's a complicated thing to suggest that someone goes into journalism right now, I should say. But but, um, but I think there the, the work that you've done at La Clinica that puts you in a position to just ask questions and to begin to get, information that then generates more questions and to kind of be in settings where um you can it's not strange to ask so many questions I, that to me the like the greatest gift of journalism is basically a kind of unselfconsciousness that you get to put on um so that you can get information and so that you can learn that you know no question is too silly or too stupid or um and and that's been very much my i mean it's it's felt like a real privilege to be able to get someone like Juan on the phone, imagine every day, you know, and say like, Juan, sorry, you've told me this story five times. Can I, just the sixth time, just there's that one detail I never understood, you know? Um, and so I, I have to say that from a storytelling standpoint, you know, my, my, my world is mediated by this, this work, the writing, the structuring of these stories. And, and one frustration I've had as, as a journalist writing about immigration, among other things, is that the immigration story in the US, just from like, imagine a conversation that I might have, say, with an editor at a magazine, it gets segmented. So, you know, the immigration conversation is a conversation about immigration policy, which sounds dry, or it's about, you know, the reality of politics in Washington, which sounds depressing, you know. Um, but this is an epic story. And I've been honestly scratching my head over the years that more journalists aren't like, you know, falling over themselves to try to get deep into this. Because like, as you say with your father, it's like you start to pan out, you know, you meet someone, you come to, you know, someone deeply as you do with your father. And, um, you, you know, you know, the details of their life on a day to day level, but then imagine like expanding out and like seeing him in the broader context of La Clinica. And then La Clinica in the broader context of Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. activism in the context of national activism. And then in the context of U.S. Central American relations. And then the wider region. And then you get to Usulutan. And to me, it's like you can like actually see, like a, I mean, the effect that it almost has for me is like seeing a map kind of just like snap into color. Um, and you see people stepping into historical moments. And Juan on the phone with me would always say, he would always drop some incredible bombshell as we were talking. Just some incredible detail that I could not believe he had. You know, something that he had witnessed, even, you know, to take one specific example from this area, the Mount Pleasant riots of, of, of 1991. I mean, Juan was like on the front lines of all of that, you know? And so this is something that I had read about, you know, as a kind of nerd. I was reading about it in like, you know, newspaper articles and books. And then Juan just starts to narrate it because he was like out on the street. Um, and I would say, Juan, I didn't know you did that. I didn't know you were there at that moment. And he would always say to me the same thing, deadpan, every single time. He would say, well, you didn't ask. And like, and he would chuckle to himself and I'd be like, all right, Juan, you know, and like back off we go. Um, but I think like, I, so this is not, there. I, I don't know exactly how to, it's a wonderful question. But like, so my answer is limited by my own experience. 
in my own profession. Um, but I think you're grasping the kind of epic nature of this. And, and to me, like, you can't get to the kind of epic quality of this, the kind of historical import of it without starting on the ground in a very kind of local, direct, immediate way. Um, and But then there's like the kind of corollary, which is like you start to al almost literally imagine like zooming out on like Google Maps and starting to put the thing in context. And I, I feel like, um, you know, if you start to pursue these questions in, from different vantages at different angles, I, it's, I mean, this makes me sound like kind of, you know, old mannish and naive, but um, I, I don't see how you couldn't be totally enthralled by the history, you know, as, as, as you've described. So I, that's not a concrete response, but I, I love the question. Thank you. I wanted to ask another um, a question from another part of the book. I haven't read it yet. I read a New York Times article before I came here about it. Um, this young boy named Eddie, uh, marijuana charge, got alienated. I think you wrote about him. The reason why it was interesting to me was because in my Spanish class at school, just recently we had covered a story of another boy who lived who grew up here. A couple of days before his 17th birthday, got caught with marijuana. Police showed up on his door the day he turned 18, hasn't seen his family since. So I was wondering how you wrote about that, if you got in contact with the family or people connected to him, because I find it pretty tragic that a young man can grow up in this country, one slip up, and he could never see his family again. Um, I'm really glad you asked about Eddie. Eddie, you know, if Juan is the kind of beating heart of the book, Eddie, Eddie was honestly its inspiration. I, I, I didn't know that there was a book or frankly like a kind of even broader piece of journalism on my hands in this area until I met Eddie and I met him in San Salvador many years after he had been deported and what's so dramatic about his case is that um, the, there was a particular law that came into effect uh, that was passed in 1996 um, that basically created a lot of the kind of structure that you're describing that you know of, of, of minor crimes a category of them known as aggravated felonies, as they're described in this law, having these kind of consequences that can upend someone's life in every sense. And Eddie was someone who had a green card. And because of the strictures of this particular law, um, you could lose your green card retroactively. So that's what happened to him. And, and I remember him describing to me being in an LA County jail after getting arrested for this minor drug charge. And like actually talking with other cellmates about like what they had heard in the news about some law. And it happened to be this law in 1996 that would put his life on a different trajectory. And just like he, they were kind of trying to game out what they understood the consequences and the implications to be. And that law has had a long and troubled and complicated history. And I think in many ways is responsible for a lot of suffering that we see to this day. Um, but even some of the people who pushed that law in particular, conservative lawmakers, actually after the fact, were hearing so many complaints from their own constituents that they actually went to the what was then called INS, which is sort of the predecessor to ICE and DHS now, and basically said, could you could you actually like soften enforcement of this law? It's like it's too harsh. But of course, you know, lives are caught up in, in, in the meantime. So Eddie, the, the reason why Eddie for me is such an important person, there, there are many things that Eddie has taught me. Um, but basically, the experience I had with him is something that kind of conditioned my whole interest in this subject, which is I was sitting with Eddie in a bar in San Salvador in February 2016. And basically, I learned more stuff about Los Angeles in the 1980s in this bar in San Salvador in 2016 than I probably would have ever known in my life. Um, and he, Eddie is, um, I, I've, I mean, Every, everyone in this book is someone I like feel deeply, deeply attached to and I've known for many years. Eddie is like a special, a special person. He's a fantastic talker. He's whip smart. He's just, he's funny. He does not, I, I should say, he does not feel sorry for, I mean, he's obviously, what, what happened to him is horrible, but he's also the kind of person who immediately was kind of hustling onto the next thing. And so actually the way I met him was a, a little bit like Juan in a way. I met him in a later stage in his life and then started to understand kind of the earlier moments that led to that to that kind of end point where I met him. 
But basically, when I was in El Salvador in 2016, um, I had heard that, about this phenomenon involving call centers, which were growing in the region uh, to cater to American cu customers here who had problems with like their IBM computer or like a problem with their bank account or like Citibank. I mean, there's like a list, Dell, Hotels.com. I mean, if you if you had a problem with your reservation on Hotels.com, you were, and, and you called the number, you were most likely talking to someone at a call center in El Salvador. Um, and, and that call center industry happened to grow at a time when there were increasing numbers of deportations from the United States back to Central America. Um, and you had, fueling that workforce, uh, you know, a large number of people who had spent at least more than five years living in the U.S., and who spoke idiomatic American English. So think about the tragic and insane irony of people who grew up here or who lived here for many years speak this like American inflected English and then get kind of moved into the customer service sector in El Salvador or in Guatemala for that matter. Um, and so Eddie, like, like many people who had been deported, went into call center work because you know, it, it's a country that he didn't know when he returned to it. He left El Salvador when he was three years old and returned when he was in his late 20s. Um, and so he's trying to get a lay of the land. It's very hard to find work. And these call centers were a reliable starting point for people, just for employment. Now, Eddie, being Eddie, always having kind of an angle, started to recognize that there was even another cottage industry that was emerging, which was language schools to teach people to speak English well enough to work in the call centers. So Eddie had this idea, and, and it was starting to pick up a little bit, but Eddie had this idea that, okay, if I start my own language school, he was kind of sick of these long shifts at these call centers. He wanted to have a little bit more control and independence in his day-to-day -day professional life. He said, okay, I can, I can kind of sell myself as, all right, I'll, I'll teach you English, learn English with a native speaker. Uh, and that was, his, that was his sort of line, and has built a successful business around that. Um, and so you know, he's someone who maybe more than anyone else, um, he kind of moves in the opposite direction of Juan geographically in this story, in the telling of the story, in that you know he starts essentially here and ends up returning to El Salvador as opposed to being in El Salvador and being driven here. Um, I mean, he was three when he came here. So for all intents and purposes, he really identified as American. But he really illustrates how deeply entwined the US and in this case, El Salvador are. And so like he was growing up in LA at a time when like, the you know the first way the first major waves of Salvadoran war refugees were arriving. Then at a certain point he was getting in trouble a lot. He was very mischievous as a kid, and I know I'm gonna I'm sorry I'm just a quick, but no, no, it's a, but you ask about Eddie I got to give you the Eddie story. Um, no no, um, but then he's getting in trouble a lot in L.A. His mom says all right I'm gonna I'm gonna scare you straight I'm gonna have you live with my brother in Soyapango in El Salvador in the end of 1991 for a year. And you're going to see how good you have it in the U.S. So he's in El Salvador in 1991, 92, at a time when two, three things are happening. One, the Civil War is finally ending. The peace accords are being signed. Two, um, the L.A. riots are starting. And so he's like calling his family from a payphone in El Salvador. And his Salvadoran friends are saying to him, hey, man, are, are you sure it's safe to go back to the U.S.? Are you sure you want to go back there? Like, you might be better off here. Um, and the third thing that he witnesses at that moment were the first deportations of kind of people who had gotten involved in street gangs in Los Angeles in the late 80s. And so he had this incredibly strange experience of like w quite literally walking down the street in a town like Soyapango or in like a city like San Salvador and like bumping into people he knew from South Central Los Angeles. Um, and so he kind of he was already like kind of woven into the sort of DNA, so to speak, of his experience. He was seeing these connections. Um, so he's someone who uh, it really like taught me so, so much about how to go about telling this story. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you asked about him. But it's but of course, underlying a story. I mean, he has a family. He has, a, you know, he has a, a loving family. He has two kids, um, a successful business in El Salvador. He, he would not he would not tell you, I mean, he, he will get upset talking about what's happened to him, but he, he doesn't identify himself as a kind of victim of immigration policy because he's, he's too dynamic and you know, multifaceted as a human being to let himself be reduced by any one thing. But as you point out, there is a tragic fact underlying all of that.
So I'm, I'm grateful you asked about it. Well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, your wonderful questions. And we could probably stay here for a few more hours um, because I, there's still so many more characters that have incredible lives and stories that you captured in this book. So thank you so much for being here, Jonathan. Um, I thought it was really wonderful to hear the themes of like the talking and telling the story. And as I kept reading it, I'm like, it's a respiration of like, the US back to the Central America. It's just this breathing back and forth and they reformulate their their towns and their their cultures back wherever they end up. It's just such a beautiful, you know, telling of all of these threads. So thank you so much for coming. And we hope you all enjoyed the the discussion and have your book um, ready. And we have a little something, oops, sorry. We have a little something for Jonathan. Um, we have one of our amazing, uh -oh. T-shirt from La Clinica. It says, healthcare is a human right. And um, La Clinica established in 1983. And you too could share, you could twin with Jonathan if you want. Um, Threadless is selling these, yes. Um, for, and for La Clinica proceeds for if you were to purchase one. So this is not the end of our evening, should you want to continue the conversation, which I'm sure so many of you do. We are having a, an open house. By the way, I'm Carolyn. I'm on the board. Um, so, <laughs> um, so we're having an open house at La Casa, which is the beautiful blue building um, on Mount Pleasant Street. And on your way out, um, we were going to, the weather today just kept giving and taking. So. <laughs> So we weren't able to, to um, execute our original plan, but we do have tea lights for you to carry over. It's kind of like a path, you know, walk over. And it's just up Lamont, and then you turn left, and you really can't miss La Casa. Um, and we would love to see you there. It's going to be a wonderful reception. Jonathan will be there. Um, so we really thank you, and um, we hope to see you over at La Casa. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's so fun. Thank you. Oh, it was so special for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 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 thank you.